here everybody knows, everybody here knows what happened on May 27th, 1999. Everybody here has a story about uh, about what they were doing that day. I mean, that, that storm impacted. The impact's going to be, the impact of that storm is going to be felt for a century. You know, I mean, it's, we're going to be remembering this. Our grandchildren are going to be, his grandchildren are going to remember this a lot. Uh, because of the impact uh, that we had. Um, one of the things, uh, I'm the managing editor of the Carson Press, by the way. I, I don't know how many of you know me. I'm John Hacker. Randy over here, Randy Turner, uh, was the managing editor of the Carson Press back in the 90s. He's now a school teacher. Uh, he's taught at Diamond. He taught at Diamond schools before he uh, went over to Joplin schools. And uh, he's now a communications arts teacher. At, uh, East Middle School in Java, which is now meeting in a former spec building in a sport, that's a warehouse at, a, uh, at the, at the uh, Crossroads Industrial Park in uh, Java. So uh, uh, obviously the uh, storm impacted his job. Uh, uh, Randy uh, sat out the storm in uh, his apartment complex at uh, just on, on 8th Street. Uh, just south of the New York Bank in Joplin, and if any of you remember, the initial, one of the initial reports before the storm actually hit was there was a tornado on the ground in seventh and rain storm. So, uh, you know, there was so much confusion, there was a lot of confusion there, right, right as, as this storm moved into town, about where people, where, where to go, where was this coming, where was this hitting. Uh, the first tornado warning that was sounded that day actually was uh, up in the Carl Junction area. Uh, it, uh, it was the, the, the area that was covered by that was North Joplin, West City, Carl Junction, off the east of that. And then next you heard the reports of the tornado, a tornado on the ground at 7th and Range Lawn. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, my sports editor is named Brennan Stebbins. Uh, that report caused him to drive south from 7th and Range Lawn. And you may have heard of heard about his the video that his the, one of his friends that was writing with him shot. It was uh, the video that was taken in the freezer at the convenience store at 20th and Duquesne. That was one of Brennan's friends. They wrote out the tornado in the freezer at uh, 20th and Duquesne. Uh, incredible story to tell there. I was that day. I was covering the uh, graduation of Jasper High School up north of Joppa. Uh, the graduation started at about 2:30. Got done about 4:30, and uh, all during that time, I'm sitting, I'm standing, watching radar on this these things here. Very handy, very handy little devices nowadays. With that, watching radar, watching the storm to spin over parts of Kansas, huge thunderstorm, just spin it and grin it over there. Just, I have no idea how much rain was dumped on parts of Kansas that day, but, uh, but that wasn't the storm that hit Joplin. The storm that hit Joplin came up from Oklahoma, and uh, the, the meteorologist told me it fed a little bit off that storm on my Parsons, but it was a separate storm. So I was coming south, I had been after the graduation, I kind of drove around and watched the storms. I drove around north of Jasper, to Jasper and Walk, and watched the storms on radar as uh, they started to develop and started to form up. Uh, just because I was trying to stay out of the way. And uh, about, five, about 515, I started to head south. Uh, and uh, 530 uh, was uh, right about even with Jasper over on 43 Highway. Uh, North 8th Street, uh, that turns into 43 North. About 545, I'm still heading south, but not very fast, and I get a call from a friend of mine. He asked me to go check on his mother. Uh, his mother lives in 22nd in Illinois. And I had actually been visiting, I'd been visiting him and his mother uh, the day before, Saturday. Uh, uh, he and his wife had come up from Texas, they lived in Texas, and come up and visited for the whole week. Up and had left Sunday morning to go home. He got as far as the Red River in Oklahoma when he starts when he starts realizing there's a problem. He calls his mother and gets his mother and his grandmother to take cover because of the storm. They said they probably wouldn't have taken cover except Jeff called them. So then the next call he made to me was the next call he made was to me and asked me to go check on his mother. So I went in. 
by way of uh, Wagner Clark and in Indiana Avenue. And you can see things, you can see things are out of place. Things just look out of place. Uh, even through Lander Park, there were things, there was debris, there was stuff, it just didn't make sense. And then you get from 7th to 15th on Indiana, and plus again, it's just out of place. Debris, where it should be stuff in the middle of the road. Then you get to 7th, between 7th, between 15th and 20th on Indiana. Yeah. I don't know how many of you remember in 2003 there were tornadoes in Carl Junction and Pierce City and Stockton and Franklin. I live in Carl Junction. I went through the 2003 Carl Junction tornado. And the, between 15th and 20th on Indiana Avenue, it looked a lot like what we saw in Carl Junction. Trees down, uh, roofs ripped off, houses, you know, houses missing the roofs, and trees in the middle of the road. But then, and it just opens up. It was a post-apocalyptic landscape. That's what I described. I wrote the uh, I wrote the story about what happened to me in here. It's uh, the second story in the book. And uh, it was just amazing how you could just the landscape. It really did open up. And there's a fire burning off to my right. There's a house over on Kentucky or Pennsylvania that was on fire. Uh, I couldn't go straight ahead. Uh, traffic was completely blocked on Indiana, so I made a left turn and parked in a piece of the church. Parking lot of the church, of course, was gone at that point. Uh, parked in a piece of the church parking lot, and I uh, started walking towards Jeff's mother's house. Uh, this is uh, page uh, 7, it's one of the scenes that I saw. Uh, walking towards Jeff's house. I tried to help these people uh, before taking pictures. Uh, I tried to help them. Uh, there was a little white car. There was an a older gentleman, he's probably in his uh, 60s, um, had a huge knot on his cheek right here. I thought, I, I honestly thought his jaw was broken, uh, the way it looked. Uh, and he's begging people to help him get uh, his wife and his mother in law out of the car, out of this car. He had to crawl out of the uh, back window of this car that was sitting on Wisconsin Avenue between 20 and 22nd Street. Uh, so there were a group of about six or seven of us who found a crowbar and started trying to pry the doors open. The doors were jammed shut. Uh, the two women were in the front seat. This is a, a bloody mess. Uh, they were alive and they were talking to us. But they were, I don't, I still don't, I don't, I never did, I wasn't able to get his name, and I don't know how they came out, but uh, they were alive to talk to us. Uh, talked to another gentleman who had, had been thrown out of his apartment into another apartment in one of those buildings uh, on Missouri Place, uh, which comes off of Wisconsin Avenue uh, to the east towards the railroad tracks. Uh, and he was struck, he, he got out, he was in shock. And all he wanted to do was talk about it. He wanted to talk about it. That was one of the things that I noticed. Walking around and talking to people. They needed to talk about it because you look around and what they're seeing and what, what's, what you see around you is just incomprehensible. Uh, the kind of destruction. So they wanted to talk. And uh, this gentleman was, saying, was talking about looking for his professor, a Pittsburgh State professor. Uh, he said he thought the guy might, have, might not have been home, but he wasn't sure. Uh, so many stories like that. Uh, and uh, then there was this guy. Uh, the cover photo it was taken about an hour after the tornado. Uh, I'm sure many of you saw these puffy, these clouds with the puffy bottoms. They're called Lamatis clouds. And they accompany severe storms. They don't necessarily accompany tornadoes. But they accompany storms with strong winds. Well, this storm had those same kinds of puffy clouds both before and after. Uh, before, the clouds you saw were gray and white. Pretty, actually, pretty serene looking, almost. Uh, very distinct puffs, looked like colors in the sky. Uh, after the tornado, you saw those same kinds of clouds, but they had this ugly brown. That's 
the dust and debris from that F5 tornado picked up and threw up in the sky, creating that color. And that's really what it looked like. That's, that's the color you saw. That, that sky was mesmerizing. I took dozens of pictures of that sky while I was walking around, uh, talking to people. Um, it was just, it was a situation where heroes were born. There was no way, in that first half an hour, there was no way that uh, emergency workers could get, could get to everybody who was trapped. So you saw people rushing towards buildings that had fallen down. There was a whole group of, a whole group of men who, uh, while we were trying to get, well, we were trying to get, well, there was a group of us trying to get that, those two women out of the car. Another group of men rushed towards those two churches. Across the, across Indiana Avenue from uh, Chapel High School, they're yelling. There's people trapped in these buildings. We have to get them out. And, uh, and uh, 50, 60 people rushing towards these things. None of them were emergency workers. They were just you and me, uh, just average people rushing to try to help their neighbors. Um, and, uh, you saw that all over Joplin in that first couple of hours. Uh, there was no way for the emergency workers to be there where they needed to be because the swamp of destruction was so huge. And then there was the shock of realizing that St. John's had been destroyed. I mean, you want to talk about a shock to the system of Joplin's been two hospitals down for a hundred years. And suddenly one of those hospitals is gone. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that happened was a lot of people, especially in the UK and the eastern part of Joplin, started coming over to the Cube Brooks Regional Hospital in Carthage. And uh, I, one of the stories in the book is that you are idiots. There's two interviews, one with the ER doctor, the other with the ER nurse at the Cube Brooks, talking about uh, the 350, 400 patients they saw in one night and how uh, doctors from Springfield uh, and other areas responded to actually to help them cope with, they were overwhelmed. Uh, they didn't have the supplies to cope with this kind of disaster. But it seemed like every time they started to run out of something, a bus or a group of cars would come, and there'd be more physicians with supplies, uh, suture material. Uh, they started to run out of suture material. And, uh, a, physician, a busload of physicians from one of the hospitals in Springfield uh, drives up just as they're starting to run out of that stuff. And they start, they, they, they step in. Uh, the hospital administration was there to grant them, you know, got to go through the paperwork. So they had to be granted temporarily, temporary privileges to work in Springfield. But the administrators were there to do that all night. Uh, everybody pitched in at the Brooks, and that story is in here. <coughs> Another story, uh, it had only been finished about 10 months before the, before the tornado, was very sudden, that's the new health sciences building. Uh, that building was designed as a simulated hospital. It has 20 hospital beds that normally have, they're basically crash test dummies, except that they're wired to have heart problems or some other kind of problems. They're wired so that nurses can practice procedures on these dummies, you know, without an injury to a live person. But you take the dummies out of those beds, you have a 25-bed hospital in on Missouri Southern Campus. And the miracle is, like I said, it just didn't finish 10 months before. Uh, and the uh, Missouri Southern staff took those, took that facility and turned it into an aid station. Uh, and it became close to a fully staffed hospital. They were able to take the load off of some of the other hospitals, some of them were minor. They, they couldn't take the severe injuries. But broken bones, uh, suturing cuts, they could do that. They were able to take some of that load off. So uh, there's that story. Um, our book has 34 different stories. It's a small sample. Uh, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of stories uh, coming from the job and from data. We've got stories from people who survived it, uh, who wrote it out of their homes and their cars. We've got people who volunteered and came to car came to Joplin uh, in the weeks after the tornado to uh, to to 
a volunteer to try to help. Um, and we've got uh, the story Will Horton, who became one of the faces of the tornado, who was a drop of high school senior, who had just graduated uh, and uh, was driving home uh, with his father. And uh, they got caught in a tornado over on the uh, Shedemaker Road. And uh, uh, Will, the teenager, Will Horton, was, was sucked out of his father's hands, of his father's arms. Uh, there are four stories of different people who knew Will Norton or were inspired by Will Norton. There's a woman here who was inspired by Will Norton to come to help, come to job with the help. So, uh, our goal, though, was to get a sample of the stories as quickly as possible. A sample, you know, so that uh, large and, uh, and people who know history would call that the first, what is it, first, a primary source material, primary source material. Uh, and uh, the other thing we've got in here are the obituaries of 160 of the people. Now, you did just find out that one of the people in here is, uh, was not a victim of the Joplin tornado. They produced that uh, tornado count of 161. Because one of the people listed in the initial 160 was actually died in Miami. Uh, but uh, all, the, all the rest of those people are here in our book. Uh, we collected the speeches from uh, the memorial service the weekend after. Uh, the pastors, uh, Pastor Eric Brown, uh, uh, father of being a Christian Catholic uh, church, was destroyed. And President Obama came to town to, to uh, help the community grieve. Uh, we've also got a uh, report for the National Letter Service uh, this year, uh, in July, or June, rather, uh, in the first few, first month after the tornado. Uh, Weather Service has issued uh, some. Uh, and another account since then, a much more detailed account of what happened during that day and a study of how uh, residents reacted. So, uh, it's 224 pages, I mean, about 220 pages. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I said, we just want to get these things as quickly as possible. Uh, because this is a mind that there will be books written about this. The Jock Globe has a book. Uh, Kansas City Star wrote a very nice book uh, put together. I've got a smaller magazine that Shelby the Ozarks magazine put together. There will be more books written about this tornado because this was this was a uh, this was a benchmark setting event, which is why you see people like the National Weather Service study this closely. Uh, Department of uh, Standards, uh, is the National Institute for Standards is studying the tornado to find out how they can better set standards to protect people in these storms like this. So, um, it was just an incredible event. I never thought I'd see my name on a book, but, uh, but uh, thanks. Randy, basically, the way we put the book together, I'll tell you this, uh, we collected a lot of stories off of Facebook. 34, there's 34 stories in here. We wrote about 17 of them, but uh, 17 of them were actually to us, people sent us their stories uh, of what happened to them, whether they survived the tornado or volunteers. So we said that they were to start to help us. Uh, and uh, we collected a lot of those stories off of Facebook. Uh, Facebook was a, uh, a huge source of uh, information. It was a source of comfort that was part of that uh, tornado. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who works in Missouri Southern now, or works in Missouri Southern, whose home was destroyed, actually put up on Facebook that uh, she was trapped in her house when her house fell in on her basement. The only way she could get any word out to anybody that she was in trouble and was trapped was to take her phone and put a post on Facebook, trapped in my basement, help. You know, you know uh, Stephanie Davis Code is her name. Uh, so. uh, that's really what I have to say. I don't want to keep everybody very long. I don't want to keep everybody very long than possible. Does anybody have any questions? What would you like to ask me? Yeah. As big as the storm was, because we live in Carthage, but as big as the storm was, the sirens went off. Yeah. I mean, they, they sounded the sirens, right. and they shut them off. Uh-huh. And then the tornado hit. Why did the, to uh, the sirens go off? Well, because the tornado warning, the first, the first tornado warning, the one that was issued, I'm going to say 517. I think that was when that first one was issued. 
That included the area north of Carthage. That was the storm. That, that, there was a storm moving in across the north part of 